You know guys, and yes I am doing this uncut and unscripted and on the fly, but you know, when it comes to Spike and Rarity's relationship, I along with a lot of people have done a lot of discussions on it, whether it's been here on the YouTube or on various parts of social media. We've talked about it. But the one question that's never been asked is why is it around? Why does it exist? And if you put your and if you put your thoughts of or you put your and if you put your love of shipping it or not shipping it or being in the middle and finding it adorable and sweet if you put all that aside and you ask the question again why is it around well I think you might find a very old school answer to your question you see Spike Spike being attracted and crushing and falling head over heels for rarity and then her later on acknowledging in a sense reciprocating returning those feelings you know and basically having this thing go as long as it has is nothing new when it comes to media we have seen this play out a variety of times in animation we've seen it play out a variety of times in live action we have seen it play out a variety if not a lot of times in comics and the reason that this happens that this kind of relationship with again you ship it or you don't or you're in the middle the reason it happens in any franchise is to basically work around the romantic blockage in other words if romance isn't like a primary topic of the franchise or the characters involved then you have to find a way around it. You have to find a way to address it, but address it in a way that it's not straightforward, like, oh, they're in love with this person, or they're both in love with each other, blah, 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 kissy, kissy, whatever. You know, you know, it's not basically as blatant or as visual as, you know, it could be at other times. You know, they have to basically find a way to like I say acknowledge it but not straight but not in a way that straightforward acknowledges it as if it's right in your face if that made any sense at all and that's why when you look at Spike and Rarity's relationship friendship if you will in the show it falls in that category and again we have seen this many times in a lot of shows in the past you know, I know Rescue Rangers, Chippendale Rescue Rangers, is a prime example of this. It is a real prime example of this. And what I mean by a prime example of this is you have Chippendale attracted to Gadget. Gadget knows this, and you have a variety of times throughout the show of them teasing some kind of romantic interlude or romantic moment between the characters, whether it's Dale and Gadget, Chip and Gadget, or someone new, like Chip and Tammy, or Dale and Foxglove, or Gadget and Sparky, they will touch upon it, on it, and acknowledge it, but not in a way that's full-blown. It's not, you know, so straightforward, if you catch my drift. And... Basically, that's how you have to view something like Spike and Rarity. Like, you know there's something romantic. You know there's a romance angle here, but it's not as straightforward in your face as you think it would be. And like I, and as I mentioned, Rescue Rangers is kind of like that. At, you know, especially with the moments it's had throughout the show when it comes to any kind of hinting or nods or something to ro to romance of any kind especially when it's within the team it's been touched upon but it's not a straightforward like in your face kind of deal and just like my little pony friendship is magic the people behind rescue rangers had to find a way to walk around it work around it to where it wasn't like i say a straightforward acknowledgement if you catch my like I said, if you catch my drift, and I'm sorry if I repeated myself there. But you see, 
rescue rangers wasn't the only ones that kind of, you know, worked their way around romance between characters in a show. So did the animated show that followed a year later by Disney, Tailspin. You see, Tailspin had a primary romantic angle in front of them that they worked their way around. They touched upon it. They made kind of an uh, well, they touched upon it, I should say. They hinted at it, but they were never straightforward with it. They had moments between the characters, but it wasn't like, okay, you know, they love each other, they're lovey-dovey, you know, they can't be away from each other, kissy-kissy deal. No. You know, it wasn't any of that. It was basically, okay, there's something there, but they're not going to, you know, touch upon it any further. They're just going to throw us little moments and Easter eggs and hints here and there. And that's Tailspin with Baloo and Rebecca. There was always something there between the two characters that obviously the creative staff behind the show would throw in to basically acknowledge that there was an attraction between the two and there might be a hint of romance blooming between them but not as much as you would think because the inspiration for Baloo and Rebecca's relationship actually came from the sitcom Cheers and the relationship between Sam Malone and the character Rebecca Donaldson. So, yeah, basically they got inspired by that, that deal right there. And even when Cheers went with that, you know, angle, kind of tried to tease a romance and even tried to do a temporary deal between Sam and Rebecca in their show, it didn't last long, but still, even after, even before and after, or should I say even after that though, they still threw Easter eggs and hints that something, somewhat, there was somewhat of an attraction, I should say, between both Sam and Rebecca, even after they had the little like fling together for a brief period. And again, the comparison and inspiration that was drawn from them for Balloon Rebecca in Tailspin, you know, is identical and similar in, in many ways. But unlike Sam and Rebecca, Sam and Rebecca from Cheers, again, they were never straightforward. They didn't come out and have them basically, you know have a fling together or have a bit of a brief romance together it was more along the lines of there was an attraction between the two and that was it and they would just have moments here and there between them and you know that's as far as they went and again as strange as a comparison as it is to what's go to what friendship is magic did with spike and rarity it's very very similar I mean, heck, you could kind of sense, in a way, if you look at, what, part three of the season premiere, or the season, or not the season, but the series premiere for Tailspin, where Baloo and Kit meet Rebecca for the first time, and Rebecca is sweet on Kit, like asking who this young man is, and how Kit's kind of shy, you could say, in a, in a way, that Kit was attracted to Rebecca, again. Again, though, even though it was an attraction, it didn't really go anywhere besides maybe a little bit of a crush, and that was it. But that crush was never really tackled upon, you know, as much in the show, as much as, you know, the Baloo and Rebecca relationship between the characters was hinted at and worked around as much as anything else. So, yeah, you had, you had your moments... Uh, with Baloo and Rebecca when it came to romance, hints and everything, but they never went full throttle with it. You know, they basically, in their own creative way, acknowledged that there was something there between them, and that was it. But, Tailspin wasn't the only show that did this, and neither was Rescue Rangers. As crazy as it sounds, even Sonic the Hedgehog, the Saturday Am cartoon kind of did it. 
But it wasn't just because, and it wasn't just of Sonic and Sally because that became something later on, especially towards the end. And there was too much going on in the, and there was too much, much between the two, too many moments, if you will, between the two in those only two seasons that the show ran to not acknowledge that they were, you know, an item. I mean, Sonic basically blurts out, you know, that fact um, in a season one episode, which Sally has to rebut against because, you know, it's playing off the fact that she doesn't, she's too prideful at that time to admit that what he said about her being his girl is kind of true because we see the result of it at the end of the series um, with Doomsday Project. But, yeah, but yeah, getting back on point, Sonic Sat AM also had this as well because um, when you think about it, it wasn't just Sonic, it wasn't, because when you think about it, there was another female character in the series, and that was Bunny Rabot. Now, some would say there's no way the two had any kind of attract an attraction, I should say, but they did. They did have some kind of, not just a good friendship, but you could tell um, as fleeting, as much as the fleeting moments were there in the series, that there was something between the two. And that the creative people and the people that were behind the show had to get creative to kind of work around that. You know, to kind of hint that there might be something like an attraction between Bunny and Sonic, but that was it. The Archie comic, which was based on the Saturday morning cartoon and vice versa, took full advantage of that later on in its series and basically teased an attraction and a romance between Bunny and Sonic. And not just because of that one moment where Bunny was making out with who she thought was Sonic, but was actually evil Sonic, a.k.a. Scourge, uh, in disguise. But, but it was after that when Bunny awarded Sonic with a kiss on the lips, a passionate one, after he saved her from being assimilated by the AI known as Adam, which was, who was created by Eggman slash Robotnik. So, yeah, even the Sonic Sat AM series and the comic book that was inspired by it and vice versa worked around, around that sort of attraction crush that Bunny had on Sonic and Sonic may have had on Bunny. And again, I know that sounds crazy, but it did happen when you look at both versions of the series. What I'm trying to allude to is this. What I'm trying to say in the end is this. That even though, oh, even though some, if not many, like myself, ship and support Spike and Rarity as a couple, and even though there are those that don't, and those are those that find it adorable and sweet, which kind of puts them in the middle, the Spike and Rarity relationship, like I said, is just something that's an old school trope that's been done many, many times. Other examples could be, you know, the Disney movie Blank Check, when you look at it that way. You know, you could even, you know, look at family matters, especially later on, on towards the series end. The point is, there's always uh, been something like this in any kind of media. And like I said, the only reason it gets worked around is because it's not the main focus of the series. It's not the main focus of, of the characters involved. If you know what I mean. It's, it's not the main focus. So they have to work around that. I mean, even TMNT, even though they had a romance in the original Archie Comics run with Raphael and the character Ninjara, a.k.a. Yumiko, you know, and it lasted for several years. Any other attraction that they had for the characters, they would work around. You know, like with, again, speaking of Raphael, you take a look at him and the character Mona Lisa. Yeah, there's a romance between those two. But besides that romance, they have to work around it. And yeah, there's a romance between April and Casey. But again, they have to work around these things because 
romance is not the main focal point of the of the franchise like TMT, TMNT, I should say. So even though they are there, they're not a primary focal point. Even though we could say we know April and Casey are an item, they're not the primary focal point. They're not. Instead, it's this. It's the it's the turtles. It's you know the adventures they're on. It's the mission to defeat Shredder. Stuff like that. I mean, even Biker Mice from Mars has a romance between. Uh, Throttle and his girlfriend Carbine, but it's not the main focus. It gets its time in the spotlight when it needs to, but it's not the primary focus. Heck, we know there's an attraction between Vinny and Charlene, or Charlie Girl as they call her, and it's definitely alluded to and hinted at and built upon in the 2006 reboot, but it's not the primary focus. It gets its time in the spotlight, like Carbine and Throttle, but it's not the primary focus. We know there's something between Callie Briggs and Jake, Jake Long, Razor, if you will, and SWAT Cats, but they don't touch upon it as much. They work around it. Again, as strange as comparisons as these are, these are just examples of the fact that Spike and Rarity's relationship and it coming into existence in the MLP franchise, in, in Friendship is Magic, is nothing new. It's something that's always been around. And whether you support it or you don't, it's something that, you know, is going to be, you have to look at and say, is a part of the franchise's history and always will be. So, basically, that's why, when you look at Spike and Rarity's relationship, why it exists in Friendship is Magic, why it came to be. Because it's an old school trope that, as I used to an example in many, of, in many of the shows and even some comics that I've mentioned, it's something that's been utilized in those and it's something that's utilized because it's, it's, an, it's a unique way of addressing romance when romance isn't the prime objective in the series. So... That's why Spike and Rarity has, you know, when fans look at them, are a unique item and couple because of the fact that they, that they basically, you know, their relationship is created off of an old school trope when you look at it. So that's all I'm going to really say though, guys, on the situation. I'm going to go get into work now before I, any later than I am. And I will talk to you all later. God bless. Take care. I'm out.